I'm Tony Orchard. This video project started out as a short presentation on the history of Nanaimo's colliery dams and is made for the Nanaimo Historical Society's January 2021 show and tell Zoom meeting. But as I uncovered more information, the more I got into it and the more interesting it became. I'm a retired engineer, so the technical stuff interests me, and hopefully you will also find this video interesting and not too long. I've lived in Nanaimo for more than 11 years, and wonder if the city tries to hide its coal mining past. The city started in the mid-1800s to supply coal to the rest of the world, but very little is left of the infrastructure that was built to harvest this coal. One of the few remnants that we can, can see and appreciate today are the dams on the Chase River that were built to supply water for coal washing. They now form an integral part of a very popular public park. And we almost lost them and their reservoirs a few years ago because of concerns about their safety. More on that later. Today, the Colliery Dam Park is well used by hikers, dog walkers, visitors, trout fishermen, and families seeking recreation in the water. TripAdvisor includes this beautiful park on its list of things to see in Nanaimo. First, a quick refresher on Nanaimo's coal history. The Hudson's Bay Company started mining coal in Nanaimo in 1854. In 1862, they sold more than 6,000 acres to the English Registered Vancouver Coal Mining and Land Company. And by 1874, when the city was incorporated, it was the chief coal producing region on the Pacific Coast. In those days, coal was the world's primary source of heat and energy, and demand was exploding. The Nanaimo's primary market was California with coal also shipped to Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, Alaska, and, believe it or not, the Hawaiian Islands. In 1903, the Vancouver Coal Company's common shares were sold to a San Francisco company, the Western Fuel Company Incorporated. And with this purchase, Western Fuel essentially owned much of Nanaimo. And by 1911, Nanaimo had a population of more than 11,000 people, with a predominance of young males. 25% were employed in mining. The Western Fuel Company operated the largest mine in Western Canada, and their number one pit head was located just south of the center of town. It had deep shafts running under the Nanaimo's harbor, and connecting shafts to Protection and Newcastle Islands. They used a lot of water for coal washing. The city had been supplying the water from their, from their reservoirs, but as the city expanded and plans for a sewer system were formulated, the city was concerned that they couldn't continue to supply water for number one. There were at least three log crib city dams on the Upper Chase River, but shortages occurred particularly during the dry summer months. So the Western Fuel Company decided to build their own water system on the Chase River in a natural basin located one mile below the city reservoirs. Unfortunately, there's no documentation on the construction of the dams and no photographs that exist showing construction. However, it is possible to piece together a lot of information by looking at old plans, listening to oral history, examining the various studies that have been made in the last 45 years, and looking at old news articles. The first dam constructed was the lower one, called the, which was originally called the Howard Dam. This plan, dated July 1909, shows the Howard Reservoir Dam and the rail line. It was commonly believed that construction started in 1910, but the earlier data map shows that work started in 1909. 
A spur line was built from the Harewood Mine rail line to bring in heavy equipment and supplies. The landscape at the time was heavily logged. This undated photograph possibly shows Howard Avenue where it crosses the Chase River. According to stories passed down from the Harewood pioneers, the reservoir basin required deepening, but unfortunately a blast broke open a fissure which allowed water to flood through the break. Fortunately, the flood didn't cause extensive damage, but the repair and further excavation required took much longer than planned. An Animal Free Press newspaper article written on November 10th, 1910, talks about the unexpected problem of building the dam in this deep rock basin and the additional blasting that was required. So on November 10th, 1910, this dam was still under construction. Apparently engineers were involved, at least in the planning and design stages. The dam was earth fill construction, 77 meters long and more than 23 meters tall. A concrete core that is at least 3.6 meters or 4 feet thick at its base provides the impervious barrier and, an, and is visible at water level on the upstream side. Joseph Neens, the Western Fuel Construction Manager at that time, tells us in a 1967 interview that the first gasoline cement mixer came to town for the job. The amount of concrete was immense, at least 2,200 cubic meters, which today would require 450 cement trucks. But imagine the work with the small mixers of the day. Finishing work was later observed to be excellent. Subsequent boreholes made to examine the quality of the concrete found aggregate size up to 75 millimeters or 3 inches in size. Rebar was sparse and not what we use today. 5 8 inch square twisted steel with one horizontal line of rebar at the top of the dam and vertical lines of rebar spaced 0.75 meters or 30 inches apart. Reservoir water volume is 173,000 cubic meters, which was at least three times the volume of the city's Chase River dams at that time. A 12 inch wood stave pipe was constructed to carry water to the coal washers. This initially followed the Chase River Valley, then kept going east following 6th Street, then crossed the Cat Stream over a trestle. It eventually passed through the reservation to the number one mine. This provided free water for the reservation. Some properties in Harewood were also eventually able to tap into the reservoir system. However, they were charged small monthly fee by Western Fuel for doing so. It would have taken considerable time to construct the two mile long pipe with trenching and support frames required. Construction manager Joseph Neens tells us in his 1967 interview that he opened the gate to start the flow of water on May 1st, 1911. It is presently assumed that both the lower and middle colliery dams were completed at the same time, but this plan from 1915 doesn't show the middle dam. Nanaimo archives also have our Western Fuel Company annual report for 1915 that only mentions the original Howard Reservoir and Dam, as well as the Harewood Dam and Reservoir that was further south near the Harewood Mine. The middle dam was smaller than the lower one, and it was 50 meters wide, 12.5 12 meters high, and the concrete core is only 0.6 meters or 2 feet thick. It holds 93,000 cubic meters. When the dam was remediated in 1980, a log crib dam was encountered completely within the downstream shell. So this wasn't the first dam at that location. 
My conclusion is that the middle dam was actually constructed around 1917 to serve as the community of Harewood and the Wakasia Mine that didn't open until 1918. And it replaced the earlier small crib dam. The Wakasia Mine was located around the present site of the Nanaimo Senior Secondary School. This map of unknown origin shows the two dams and the Wakasia Mine. In 1928, Canadian collieries purchased the common shares of the Western fuel operations. Over time, coal demand continued to go down. There was a loss of market share from the 1913 strike. Ships converted to oil, and the Great Depression hit Nanaimo hard. The large number one mine closed in 1938, and in 1945, the colliery dams were decommissioned. Safety of the dams required regular inspection and maintenance, which put an increasing burden on Canadian collieries, particularly after most of their mines closed. This would have become very apparent in November 1955, when heavy rain caused flooding over the top of the middle dam. A newspaper reports expressed serious concern that the dam would fail, releasing enough water to cause the lower dam to also fail and flood the lower land below. The dam did, in fact, fail at one corner and is repaired by sandbagging. A hole was also made in the dam to increase spill capacity and the hole was repaired in 1980. In 1960, after leasing the property for three years, the Harewood Improvement District purchased the property for $24,000 to use as a park. In 1975, the district was dissolved and became part of Nanaimo. The Colliery Down Park was dedicated as a public park by public referendum in 1980. Improvements were made to the reservoirs in the 60s and 70s to improve access to the public and provide safe swimming. This poor quality photo of the upper reservoir appears to have been taken in the 1960s. It is interesting to note that the trees have grown considerably since then. Once the city of Nanaimo had responsibility for the dams in 1975, they were thoroughly inspected in 1976 by EBA, EBA Engineering, and a further review was made by Willis, Cunliffe and Tate, and Golder Associates, who recommended and designed substantial remedial work. And the dams did need a lot of work. Pictures from the 1976 inspection showed damage to the bridges over the spillways and heavy vegetation and tree growth on the downstream slopes. In 1980, a compacted sand gravel berm was added to the downstream slope of the lower dam to prevent further erosion of existing material. And the wood stave water outlet that passes through the lower dam was filled with concrete. The middle dam's downstream shell was reconstructed by excavating and replacing a su substantial amount of fill material, and the dam's height was raised by 12 inches. One of the reasons for the downstream excavation was to, delete, was to locate an expected outtake pipe going through the dam, but they couldn't find one. I wonder if, in fact, the only outtake pipe actually traveled north to to the Harrow community and the Wakasia mine. Concern about the safety of the dams continued, and during the period 2003 to 2012, the city commissioned studies on their safety and their probability of catastrophic failure from floods or a major earthquake. After receiving an EBA engineering dam safety report in 2010, the city developed removal plans, and the city council narrowly passed a motion to remove 
both dams on October 22, 2012, at an estimated cost of $7 million. This was met with a huge public outcry, and the Save the Dams campaign began. Fortunately, the City Council agreed to commission additional engineering studies to further clarify their safety and to find a cost-effective solution to save them. So after further studies in the dam's earthquake resistance and an assessment of the spillway capacity to handle heavy rain events, it was recommended that a second spillway be constructed on the lower dam. In 2015, the city agreed to spend $4.3 million to construct the second spillway, and the work was completed in the spring of 2016. Remedial work to the middle dam has been postponed until at least 2023, while hydrology studies continue. Studies show the middle dam could be damaged by seismic activity, but the low amount of water that would be released slowly uh, would be unlikely to affect the lower dam. Fortunately, the city and its people support maintaining and keeping the dams for the enjoyment of present and future generations. And today, the beautiful park is well used and enjoyed. Walking trails have been built in the park. The beauty of the still reflective water in the reservoirs and water rushing down the spillways make this park one of the top attractions in Nanaimo. We owe its beauty to the Western Fuel Company and the coal mines it operated. And thanks for watching.